Next, our one-on-one -on -one conversation with Senator Bill Brady, who was the Republican nominee for governor in 2010 and is again seeking the governor's office. We hear his policy positions and why he thinks Illinois will elect a Republican governor in 2014. This runs about 30 minutes. Senator Bill Brady, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Good to be with you again. You, as anyone who follows politics, will remember you were the Republican nominee for governor the last time around. You uh, squeaked by in the primary. Uh, I think you defeated Senator Dillard by, what, 193 votes or so, and uh, were competitive, very competitive in the uh, general election. In fact, I recall looking at the votes for, uh, for some time during that night. You had the lead, and I, as I recall, and then you were coming, it was kind of bouncing back and forth. and. Uh, Eventually, Governor Quinn, obviously, was the victor in that. Right. You have announced that you're going to be a candidate again in 2014. So, having gone through this actually twice before, once being the nominee, yeah. why, why go for a third term, why, or attempt at the governorship? Well, I, we believe in Illinois. I, I believe the state deserves better leadership. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't believe that if the rematch were today, uh, I'd prevail against Governor Quinn and, and likely the only Republican who would be able to build on the successes and the, the respect we earned from the voters in the last election. We won 98 counties, uh, barely lost in three, and uh, didn't do well as well as we wanted to in Cook County, and uh, particularly in the Chicagoland area. Uh, but I think the voters have learned a lot. Uh, they've gotten more comfortable with my positions and my 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 strengths, and I think they've gotten less comfortable with Pat Quinn and uh, the shortcomings of his administration. Before we get, I want to get into the issues, and, but when you look back at your own campaign and apply, wh what lessons did you learn, if any, yeah. from that campaign that would you do anything different as you go into this one? Well, there's all kinds of things you do different here or there. Some things that are outside of your control that you might try to alter the implications of which. But what I probably learned the most is Illinois is a, a big state. Uh, I'm a small businessman in Bloomington, Illinois, uh, who had uh, run before, uh, won a primary, uh, built a base of support. Uh, but in a, in a general election, it's a tough state, uh, particularly if you're a Republican. This state is 40 percent Democrat, 30 percent Republican. Uh, we lost by less than one half a percent, which means we not only we not only earned the base of the Republican Party, but we we did real well with independents and some Democrats to overcome that. Uh, and building on that is the most important thing. Some people say you need to spend more time in Chicago, and, and they're right. We've we've reached out and worked with Latino groups and uh, black uh, organizations, particularly black ministerial uh, associations on jobs and public safety and reducing crime. Uh, but it's a mixture of getting better known, building on what we've built in Chicago and the Cook County area, as well as encouraging a bigger turnout in the 98 of 102 counties uh, we did very well in. You know, I'm curious when you reach out to uh, the black community, as you said you have, what, what response do you get? Good response. Uh, they become much more comfortable with me. They, we share a lot of interests. We know that jobs are important. Under the Democratic control in Springfield, particularly Pat Quinn, we've lost 290,000 jobs. And that affects the livelihood of their families that they represent. Uh, we've seen crime run rampant. Uh, we're looking to, to change that through giving people the right to conceal carry like uh, we just did today in the General Assembly, overriding Governor Quinn's uh, failed veto, as, as well as encouraging the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, to to work with local law enforcement to crack down on gun crime, making our streets safer, like we've seen happen in in Richmond, Virginia, and other places where they've seen crime cut by as much as half. Uh, so there's a lot of commonality of interest, and clearly uh, the Latino and the black communities, particularly in Chicago, have learned uh, that the Democratic control, and particularly Governor Quinn, has not served them well. You brought up what. Uh, as we tape this, we just had both the House and Senate override the governor's veto, and so the concealed carry bill that was passed in, the, in May is now going right. to be the law. Uh, and this on Ju uh, July the 9th, which was the deadline set by the uh, federal court for that to happen. Uh, on, on that, uh, give us your own thoughts on the concealed carry bill that's passed. Well, it's a historic day. It's a landmark day for Illinois. Uh, the courts ruled rightly. 
uh, that Illinois citizens should share the same constitutional rights that 49 other states have given them. The legislature worked hard to pass a bill learning from all the other states and learning that proper background checks, learning about how important education and training is to make the law of the land a good law. Uh, unfortunately, the governor was disengaged or not as engaged as maybe he should have been in the process. He mandatorily vetoed the bill, forcing the Illinois General Assembly to come back at the last hour and override, which we knew we might have to do, uh, wasting taxpayer dollars. Uh, but I, I think this points to the ineffectiveness of this administration. As I said before, whether you like Pat Quinn or not, and I happen to think he's a nice guy, uh, this administration has been ineffective in terms of dealing with the problems facing Illinois and taking a leadership role, whether it's been concealed carry, pensions, uh, balancing the budget, uh, maintaining an infrastructure by preserving road fund dollars, uh, and living within our means, and most importantly, uh, the loss of jobs under Pat Quinn's reign as governor. Uh, I was going to say, you. what do you, when you look at, and there's a variety of issues and ones I want to sure. talk to, I want to not only conceal carry, but pensions, the economy. W when you look at what's happening to the state, what do you pick as the number one issue and challenge facing it? Well, I'd say the number one issue is the loss of 290,000 jobs in the last five years, the net loss. That devastates families that are looking for gainful employment. It also has a bottom line impact to the state's budget. I estimate four to four and a half billion dollars a year. But that in itself uh, requires solutions. It means fiscal responsibility, which means pension reform. Pension reforms means protecting the interests of the people in the state pension systems who've paid in each and every year, uh, looking for their retirement years, but also balancing that with the interest of the taxpayers. I truly believe that we can give people what they've earned and balance the interest of the taxpayers if we come up with meaningful reform. To date, this governor just hasn't been able to get that job done. And it takes a strong governor to do that. It means reconciling state spending to living within your means. Uh, we have over seven billion dollars in unpaid bills. Uh, that's no way to run state government. And the hardship that places on the people we depend for human services and other things has, has adversely affected that. So when you, look at, when you look at the effect of fiscal mismanagement, lack of pension reform, uh, that gives caution to the private sector who invests in jobs. And they've got a whole host of states, uh, governors that are trying to poach our jobs away from us that, frankly, they're being successful uh, because we haven't put our fiscal house in order. So we need someone who will stand up and understand the importance of that. But it also means things like workers' compensation reform, the balance, the interest of the injured worker, uh, along with the employer who's trying to employ that worker uh, to gainfully employ them. So a variety of things that would improve both the uh, the cost, the spending on right. the on the side, but also some of the uh, business environment. And uh, let me go to that. I mean, on one hand, to give people a little bit of a background who may not recall. Uh, it, so you're a small businessman, you have alluded to that. Let's talk about that, but I know you and I have talked off camera. It, Illinois is going to have to go through some tough choices in cutting the budget. You as a businessman uh, had to go through some very tough times when the economy went down. Uh, just yeah. remind us of what yeah. business are you in and what, what challenges did you face and how have you met them? Well, uh, I'm in the housing business. Uh, we employ several realtors and uh, people associated with the real estate industry, home construction business, property management, mortgage finance, and others. And uh, I don't know that we can think of uh, recent history where that industry has been hit so hard. We had to reconcile our spending, live within our means, uh, deleverage ourselves by getting rid of some, some debt and some assets uh, that we thought would be productive subdivisions down the road. But we've done that, and uh, we've been able to keep gainfully employing people. In fact, we started some new businesses, a, a water restoration business, and, and increased other areas of our business to survive. And that's what Illinois needs to do. It needs to realize what the next economy is going to look like. And then it's, it needs to position itself to meet the challenges of the next economy and the jobs it will create. But it has to understand that in order to do so, uh, you've got to be a solid place to make a business investment. Uh, businesses know that if a government can't reconcile its spending to live within its means, it will go back on the taxpayers. It's more likely to go back on the taxpayers who can't vote, like businesses and other things. So uh, it's very fearful of what uh, poor operating governments will do. Uh, 
Uh, and we've seen that as we've tried to attract businesses at the local level within my Senate district and around the state. Let me interject. When we, a lot of people, I think, they don't understand why can't government live within its means, and they tend to look at their own home budget That's and go, right. you know, we've made cuts. The thing I point out to people, though, in government, at, at both at the federal and state level, are the entitlement spend the pension, as an example, is one of them. Uh, but the federal program of Medicaid is another, to where we have this spending on automatic pilot. Uh, as the baby boomers retire, yeah. as m our pension costs are going to be going up unless, unless change is made. On the pension, you and I have talked about it before. You've been involved. You're a member of the conference committee. As we say this, we don't know what a conference committee product would be that would try to be a, a sold to both House and Senate members that they could vote for. But what changes, as you've heard the issues, you know the issue, sure. what are your thoughts on how we can control the yeah. state pensions? And well, to what extent do we make yeah. it both A, constitutional, and B, fair to those who are right. promised something? Well, let's put this in the proper framework. First of all, it's, it's unfortunate uh, that the people who will pay for the price of the reforms uh, are the people who've taught our children, who've protected our streets, who've built our roads, who've, who've done the things that our state employees do for us. And uh, it's unfortunate. But uh, after a decade of governors not funding pension systems, uh, legislatures passing budgets that didn't fund pension systems, be it Republican and Democrat. I mean, a lot of people have asked me, Bill, why haven't you voted for budgets? I haven't voted for budgets because they failed to sh hold the test of fiscal responsibility, which meant funding our pensions. This governor has taken uh, two opportunities to borrow to fund the pensions and created an environment that is, is much where we are today. In fact, the committee that I'm on it will tell you, uh, COGFA, our local government forecasting unit, uh, proved to us that over half the costs associated with the unfunded pensions came because governors and legislators either borrowed and didn't fund or created debt and took holidays and all those things. So it is unfortunate that we're a hundred billion dollars plus unfunded. But in order to protect and preserve as best we can the interest of the people who've paid into the system, we're going to need to reform the way we move forward. And the, the way we move forward has to do a lot with the cost of living increases that people get and contributions that are going to be required to be made uh, by people who are employed by these systems, or not by the systems, but the employed by the government that will go into these systems. Uh, right now, we're trying to focus on the university president's uh, program, which would cost for an increased contribution from current employees. And pretty much, they've agreed to that in other legislation. And when you say we're trying to do that, we're, we're being what, the conference committee? Well, there's a committee? conference committee of 10 of us who were appointed to try to resolve this. And so... I, I want to make that as distinct yeah, from the Brady campaign. That's a good point. Uh, although many of the provisions of what we're doing are things I've been talking about for years. But it is the conference committee that's laying this out. And we're trying to arrive at a, a goal, a goal in terms of savings uh, that is yet undefined but that will strengthen and solidify the system to meet the obligations, but yet protect the taxpayers so that we can do th continually fund education and public safety and transportation. So the two really key elements here in terms of the reforms are uh, asking prospectively employees to make a larger contribution, one or two percent, likely two. Uh, two is to, rather than a, receive a guaranteed 3% cost of living increase each and every year that is compounded. The, the university presidents have suggested that half of the actual uh, cost of living increase, half of that would be applied, and they've suggested it be compounded. Now, we're looking at variations of that, but we're using the framework of that proposal to see if we can hit a number that provides enough savings, coupled with, coupled with the funding uh, the key here is if the, if the requirements to fund come down, the ability to fund uh, will be easier and yet guaranteed uh, because that's what we need to make sure. We need, need to make sure that governors like Quinn and Bogoyevich and uh, legislators can't uh, not take seriously the funding of our pension systems. 
Uh, so those are the, the key elements of this program. Uh, it, I don't want to get, uh, to be fair to you, I don't want to get too lost in, I mean, this, sure. it's an important issue. But to focus yeah. more on the Bill Brady campaign, but, but to point out, as we take this, the conference committee has not come out. People are speculating, at least people I talk to are speculating, maybe by the end of July, there might be something to be considered in August. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Well, we will see. Uh, I, hope, I hope we don't go into August. Do you think, uh, relative to pensions, and we'll move on to something else, maybe, but uh, do you think that whatever reforms are going to be coming will be in place prior to the next governor being sworn in? Well, if we can arrive at something, I, frankly, I think it's critical that we get something done in July. If we don't, I fear that we may not get to where we need to be until there's a different governor. Um, but uh, I think the way this is structured, the reforms could take place as early as the beginning of next year, depending on the court challenge and some other things, uh, if, if we can get this. And again, this is all about making sure that everything everybody's earned to date is protected and that we don't diminish what they've earned. And, and that's why it's important to us for the constitutional question uh, that we are working in the, uh, under the uh, constitutional provision of offer and consideration. Uh, so making some alterations, some positive, uh, some, some that may not be prospectively as positive as they would have had. Illinois has a massive problem with finances, everyone knows. The pensions that we've been talking about is one of them. Uh, last year, in 2012, the legislature made changes to the Medicaid system to try to cut down the cost on that. But we now find that the state is also looking to make changes going forward to Medicaid that would increase the Medicaid rules, which is health care for the indigent. Uh, by 500,000 people. Right. Uh, it somewhat sends a mixed message. One would think that Illinois has, is flush with money if they're looking to expand the Medicaid rolls by 500,000. Yeah, and this, this is where the legislature and the governor, I think, were misled by the federal government. With the promise, oh, we'll pay for all of it. Well, that never happens. Uh, the expansion of Medicaid this year, I, I think, will, will prove to diminish our ability to provide critical services to those that were already entitled to those services. The, the thing I, I think is interesting when we look at Illinois and we think of it as a blue state is that it really it's uh, predominantly the Cook County, Chicago area that's uh, solidly democratic. Uh, and yet on the other hand, two thirds of the population of Illinois lives in the Chicago land area, not just Cook County, but, uh, but w what do you do to win those votes? I mean, obviously yeah. Cook County uh, or Chicago hasn't elected a Republican mayor yeah. since what, the 1920s or well, something. People have said in the past, they said it before you got the nomination, that you were too conservative to be elected statewide. Now you came yeah. very close. What concerns do people have? It seems like one, abortion might be one of the issues. You're, yeah. you're pro-life, right? But as you talk to the Chicago land area voters, what could you do this time around to get more votes out of Chicago than, than what you got before? Well, I, let me tell you a little story. Uh, after the election, uh, Governor Jeb Bush gave me a call and said, you know, Bill, I don't know if you're going to run again or not, but let me tell you a story. Uh, he said, I wouldn't have won the second time if I didn't lose the first. He said, in big states like uh, Illinois and Florida, where you're not well known. He said, you may recall, George was running in Texas when I was running in Florida. And George was uh, down five points the week before the election. Like you, I was up five points the week before the election. I lose by 60,000, you lose by 30, but George wins. So th the difference in those states where you're just newly introduced in terms of a general election, big states like that, is those horrific attack ads uh, tend to push the undecided. Bush family was so well known in Texas that George wins. Uh, I was not well known in Florida and I lost and in your first time you weren't well known in Illinois. So big states like that you got to get better known and I think that's going to be one of the things that strengths that we can build on that no other candidate. Uh, that we're better known, uh, people are more comfortable uh, and I think that will will help us. We, we not only 
won 98 counties, but realizing that those counties included the suburban counties to cook. So we did very well. In a lot of places, uh, people didn't think, in fact, better than recent candidates for governor. So I really believe we'll build on those strengths. We only need 16,000 more votes uh, to win the next election. And uh, I think it's the, the respect that we've earned on our policies, the, the positions that we've taken, uh, that will, will earn us the additional votes we need. Uh, and, and that squarely is focused on what we can do economically to enhance the lives of the citizens of Illinois. You know, as we tape this, we don't know who will be the Democratic nominee, so it's not as if you might even be running against Governor Quinn. Uh, but using the current governor, Governor Quinn, as a uh, example, how would you be different? In other words, let's let's take the management side of right. it. Com compare and contrast on some of these issues, like like the budget uh, and spending and uh, the rest well, uh, pensions. How, uh, what would you be doing? Uh, differently than Governor Quinn? That's a great question. Uh, one of the things we won't be doing is misleading the people. In the last election, I told them the truth. We're going to consistently tell them the truth and then we're going to pass it. We told them that the pension system in Illinois is unsustainable and we need reforms. Governor Quinn said it's not a problem. Uh, but yet, I think that's one of his problems in addressing the problem. At the core of his beliefs, I'm not sure uh, where he is. Uh, we said we've got to reconcile state spending to live within our means without raising taxes. Uh, Governor Quinn said, I will never raise taxes 2%. Well, what did he do? He raised taxes 2%. It tears at the fabric of uh, integrity and it tears at the economic fabric of our state. Uh, we're not going to let taxes continue to be at the level they're at. Uh, and we'll live up to that promise. We are going to redefine government spending uh, to prioritize it so that we're doing the best we can with every dollar we've got. Uh, and we are going to solve the pension crisis. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going we're to do the things we've always said and we're going to turn this state around and then focus on how we can be a place that creates private sector jobs enhancing the lives of families. But we're not going to mislead the public and, and, and that's going to be pivotal. And I think the people learned from the last election. Uh, most of the things we said needed to be done uh, even the Democrats now agree need to be done. We touched on the uh, the expansion of Medicaid uh, that was part of the Obamacare thing. Would, is that something though that you would oppose? Would you try to get the state of Illinois out of that expansion, or how would you address that issue? Well, it's going to be very difficult once you're once you're there. I, I think the key to Medicaid is making sure that we get the best care for every dollar we have to spend. Uh, and serving the best people in the most affordable way. I also think a key is to make sure that only those people who are entitled to Medicaid uh, receive it. Uh, one of the How major concerns. Well, yeah. we, we, we would verify that they are Illinois residents entitled to Medicaid and, and not just someone who came in, got a card, and starts receiving benefits. So we would use various standards of verification uh, to make sure that they truly do qualify for the benefits offered in Illinois. I presume... And, and on a continual basis that they continue uh, to, to be eligible for those benefits. I was going to say, I, I presume when your campaign, when you were the nominee and, and you went around, did you meet with leading executives of uh, companies, uh, oh. corporations and all? What, what kind of things were they telling you that they want to have changed in the state? And to what extent yeah. did you... Did that yeah. support what your thoughts were, or did yeah. you get more well, of an education from that? You're absolutely right. That's where many of the platforms and the ideas that we're putting forth come from. They say, you know, I, how do I convince my company to invest more money in the state that's $7.5 billion behind in paying its bills? Uh, we need you to live within your means. Uh, how do I convince my company to invest in a state that has $100 billion unfunded pension liabilities? We need you to rectify that. Um, they know that Illinois is ripe for opportunity. I mean, we, are, we have more resources in this state than I can find in any other state, from, from the soil and the agricultural base to the coal and the, and the oil and the natural gas that lies beneath the soil to the infrastructure and right-of-way we have for rail, roads, river, and air, uh, the university systems that we have and the educational opportunities those provide, uh, the, the, 
the basic diversity we have from Chicago to Metropolis and in between, uh, as, as well as the fact that we are located in the center of this country's economic opportunity or universe, if not the nation, if not the world. So they know that this is the place they want to be, but it's hard to invest in a state that raises taxes uh, on the backs of businesses and families, extracting one week's pay, and a state that still, with that, uh, and, and we knew it would be a problem because when you raise taxes, you drive down private sector opportunity. When you drive down private sector opportunity, you lose jobs. When you lose jobs, you lose taxes. It was a vicious cycle that Pat Quinn and the Democrats put us on that we need to reverse. But that's what the businesses tell us. They also say we need workers' compensation reform, fairness in workers' compensation so that uh, they can be competitive with other states so that our injured workers are treated fairly, uh, but, but not in a way that increases costs so excessively that it's hard to compete in Illinois. So these are the foundational principles that they want to see. I'd say they're also worried about an educated workforce, making sure that our institutions of higher education, our schools are funded properly. Property taxes are another thing. Uh, we've got to make sure that we dedicate more dollars to education as a percentage and a priority so that the property tax burden on families and on businesses uh, can be dim diminished uh, and, and not such a burden that it's a barrier to employment in Illinois. You know, there's always sometimes I, I hold myself back from asking certain questions because you can get lost in the minutia of certain things. But, um, when you decided here, it's, it's got to be uh, tough on you as an individual. It's got to be tough on your family to be going around. It's a lot of sacrifice, uh, an inordinate amount of time on the road and away from just relaxing at home. How, how hard of a decision was it to say, you know, you want to do it again for you and your family? Well, it's, it is, you're right, it's a sacrifice. Uh, I was raised to uh, give back to my community and my state in terms of public service. Uh, and uh, but it does take a lot of time, and uh, it's it was a bitter you know pill to swallow, losing by less than a percent. But as I traveled around the state, uh, I talked to people, and they said you've got to finish the job. Uh, clearly, I've I've not been raised to quit on anything, particularly the people of Illinois, or this election. I do believe, uh, like Jeb Bush and Bobby Jindal and others, it sometimes takes more than one election in a general election. Uh, to win and build on it. And I'm the only one, I believe, that has the opportunity to do that within the Republican Party. So it was in some ways a tough decision, uh, time away from family, but our children uh, are, are not at home right now. Katie's a nurse in Chicago and William's a lawyer in Chicago and Duncan's a, a sophomore in college. So a little more free time than what we had before. So a little easier from that standpoint, but it is a lot of time, but it's also very rewarding. Uh, as you travel around the state, uh, the people of Illinois are gracious, they're caring, they really believe in the future of Illinois, and uh, it's rewarding in the sense that you can help them. I just walked in a parade in Arlington Heights over the 4th of July, and uh, the hundreds of people who said, Bill, you got to finish the job for us. Uh, make sure you win this time. Uh, it, it, it's an important part of the process, and it makes it so much easier. All right, well, Senator Bill Brady, we appreciate you taking the time. Maybe as we get closer to the primary, we can yeah. follow up with you and do this again. Absolutely, Terry. Thanks, so, Thanks much. so much. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.